This is the IELTS listening test. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four parts. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Now turn to part one. Part one. You will hear a woman and a man talking about their work at a library. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Hello. I'm Mrs. Phillips, the head librarian. You're the new library assistant, aren't you? Yes, I'm Robert Haskell, but please call me Bob. All right, Bob. Let me take a few minutes to explain how the library works and what your duties will be. First, the library opens at 8.30 in the morning, so naturally we expect you to be here and ready to work by then. Of course. And you can go home at 4.30 when the library closes. Now, let me explain where everything's kept. It looks like here on the ground floor is where the reference books are. Yes, that's right. Up on the second floor is where the adult collection is, both fiction and non-fiction. And the children's books are there too, aren't they? I thought I saw them in the room by the stairway. No, those are magazines and newspapers and newspapers for adults. Children's books are up one more flight on the third floor. We'll take a look at them later. Let me show you how we organize our work. Do you see that brown book cart over there? The one by the door? Yes, that one. Those books have been checked in and need to go back on the shelves. Okay, so the brown book cart has books to reshelve. What about this black cart by the desk? Those books have torn pages or damaged covers. They're all books that need to be repaired. Okay, I know how to do a lot of that. I'm pretty good at mending torn pages and covers. That's great, because we really need help with that. And that white cart in the corner, what are those books for? Those are old books that we've taken off the shelves to make room for new ones. We sell them as used books to raise money for the library. So they're all ready to sell? Yes, that's right. So now you know what to do with the books in the carts. Let's talk about our activity schedule. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. I understand this library has a number of interesting activities every week. Yes, our activities are quite popular. The most popular one is story time for the children. Do a lot of children show up for that? Yes, a good many. It takes place in the children's room on Thursday mornings at 11. Isn't there a family movie night too? Yes, but it's not at night anymore. We used to have family movies on Fridays when the library is open until 9, but now we have a different activity at that time, so we had to switch family movies to the weekend, Saturday afternoon. How much do you charge for the movies? They're all free. The movie always starts at 2.30 in the reference room, but you don't have to worry about that since you don't work on weekends. And what takes place on Friday evenings? We've just started a weekly lecture series. We have a different speaker every week, and the lectures cover all different kinds of topics. That sounds like something I'd be interested in attending. Good, because we'll need your help with that. You'll be working Friday evenings, and one of your duties will be to set up the meeting room on the first floor for the lecture. What time will you need that done? Let's say by 6.15. The lecture starts at 6.30, and the room needs to be ready well ahead of time. A lot of people arrive early. 
Maybe I should have the room ready by six? That wouldn't be a bad idea. Okay, why don't I take you upstairs and show you the rest of the collection? That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part 2 You will hear the Chairman of the Highways Committee of Granford speaking to members of the public about proposed changes to traffic and parking in the area. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 13. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 13. Good evening, everyone. My name's Phil Sutton, and I'm chairman of the Highways Committee. We've called this meeting to inform members of the public about the new regulations for traffic and parking we're proposing for Granford. I'll start by summarising these changes before we open the meeting to questions. So, why do we need to make these changes to traffic systems in Granford? Well, we're very aware that traffic is becoming an increasing problem. It's been especially noticeable with the increase in heavy traffic while they've been building the new hospital. But it's the overall rise in the volume of traffic of all kinds that's concerning us. To date, there's not been any increase in traffic accidents, but that's not something we want to see happen, obviously. We recently carried out a survey of local residents, and their responses were interesting. People were very concerned about the lack of visibility on some roads due to cars parked along the sides of the roads. We'd expected complaints about the congestion near the school when parents are dropping off their children or picking them up. But this was on top of the list, and nor were noise and fumes from trucks and lorries, though they were mentioned by some people. We think these new traffic regulations would make a lot of difference. But we still have a long way to go. We've managed to keep our proposals within budget, just, so they can be covered by the Council. But, of course, it's no good introducing new regulations if we don't have a way of making sure that everyone obeys them. And that's an area we're still working on with the help of representatives from the police force. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 14 to 20.
Now listen and answer questions 14 to 20. OK, so this slide shows a map of the central area of Granford with the High Street in the middle and School Road on the right. Now, we already have a set of traffic lights in the High Street at the junction with Station Road, but we're planning to have another set at the other end at the School Road junction to regulate the flow of traffic along the High Street. We've decided we definitely need a pedestrian crossing. We considered putting this on School Road, just outside the school, but in the end we decided that could lead to a lot of traffic congestion. So we decided to locate it on the High Street, crossing the road in front of the supermarket. That's a very busy area, so it should help things there. We are proposing some changes to parking. At present, parking isn't allowed on the High Street outside the library, but we are going to change that and allow parking there, but not at the other end of the High Street near School Road. There'll be a new no parking sign on School Road, just by the entrance to the school, forbidding parking for 25 metres. This should improve visibility for drivers and pedestrians, especially on the bend just to the north of the school. As far as disabled drivers are concerned, at present they have parking outside the supermarket, but lorries also use those spaces, so we've got two new disabled parking spaces on the side road up towards the bank. It's not ideal, but probably better than the present arrangement. We also plan to widen the pavement on School Road. We think we can manage to get an extra half metre on the bend just before you get to the school, on the same side of the road. Finally, we've introduced new restrictions on loading and unloading for the supermarket, so lorries will only be allowed to stop there before 8am. That's the supermarket on School Road. We kept to the existing arrangements with the High Street supermarket. OK, so that's about it. Now, would you like... That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3 You will hear two students talking about a class assignment about wild bird rescue and rehabilitation. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. As you listen to the first part of the conversation, answer questions 21 to 25. OK, let's go over the requirements and see what we have left to do. Let's see. We have to give the professor a written summary of the information we've gathered on our topic, wild bird rescue and rehabilitation. The other written thing we have to turn in is a case study of the rehabilitation of one bird. We have the information on that already. Right. All we have to do is write it up. What about charts and graphs? Do we need to include something like that? I don't think so. 
They aren't really relevant, but we do have to turn in a list of the resources we used. Naturally. What about videos? I heard some of the other students were doing that. Well, I guess that must be optional, because I don't see it on the requirements list. Okay, we should start planning our class presentation, since that counts for half the grade. We've looked at lots of sources of information, but I think our best source was the interviews we did with the wildlife rehabilitators. Agreed. That and the journal articles. I think we have enough, in enough information from those two sources for the presentation anyhow. The books we looked at weren't all that helpful. I wonder if we should try to bring in some live birds for the presentation. That would be too difficult, don't you think? But we have lots of photos of rehabilitated birds. We can show those. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Right. OK, I think we should start by talking about how to rescue a bird. Probably first we should help people understand which birds need rescuing. Yeah, that's really important. Because a lot of times people see a baby bird that's all alone, or they find a bird sitting on the ground and they think it needs to be rescued. And usually, those are just baby birds learning to fly. So we should emphasize that people should only attempt to rescue a bird that's clearly injured. For certain kinds of birds, the rescuer needs to wear protective gloves because some of those birds have sharp claws and can tear your shirt or worse, injure your face or some other part of your body. Yes, that's an important point. OK, next, let's tell people to put the injured bird in a box a box with good air circulation. We should let them know that a cage isn't necessary and a bag, especially a plastic one, could hurt the bird more. Another thing we need to say is that the best way to help the bird stay calm is not by petting it or talking to it, but by leaving it completely alone. Then people should take the bird to the bird rescue center as soon as possible. Right, and we should also point out that when they're driving the bird to the rescue center, it's better not to play music on the radio or talk loudly because those things just stress the bird. Yes, it's better just to speak quietly while you have the bird in the car. OK, we've got that part covered. Next, we should talk about what happens at the rescue center. That is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three. Part 4 You will hear a university lecture about an endangered bear in British Columbia, Canada, known as the Spirit Bear. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Today, we continue our series on ecology and conservation with a look at a particularly endangered member of the black bear family. One in ten black bears is actually born with a white coat, which is the result of a special gene that surfaces in a few. Local people have named it the spirit bear, and according to the legends of these communities, its snowy fur brings with a special power. Because of this, it has always been highly regarded by them, so much that they do not speak of seeing it to anyone else. It is their way of protecting it when strangers visit the area. The white bear's habitat is quite interesting. The bear's strong relationship with the old-growth rainforest is a complex one. The white bear relies on the huge, centuries-old trees in the forest in many ways. For example, the old-growth trees have extremely long roots that help prevent erosion of the soil along the banks of the many fish streams. Keeping these banks intact is important because these streams are home to salmon, which are the bear's main food source. In return, the bear's feeding habits nurture the forest. As the bears eat the salmon, they discard the skin and bones in great amounts on the forest floor, which provide vital nutrients. These produce lush vegetation that sustains thousands of other types of life forms, from birds to insects and more. Today, the spirit bear lives off the coast of the province of British Columbia on a few islands. There is great concern for their survival, since it is estimated that less than 200 of these white bears remain. The best way to protect them is to make every effort to preserve the delicate balance of their forest environment. In other words, their ecosystem. The greatest threat to the bear's existence is the loss of its habitat. Over many years, logging companies have stripped the land by cutting down a large number of trees. In addition, they have built roads which have fractured the areas where the bear usually feeds, and many hibernation sites have also been lost. The logging of the trees along the streams has damaged the places where the bears fish. To make matters worse, the number of salmon in those streams is declining because there is no legal limit on fishing at the moment. All these influences have a negative impact on the spirit bear's very existence, which is made all the more fragile by the fact that reproduction among these bears has always been disappointingly low. And so, what's the situation going forward? Community organizations, environmental groups, and the British Columbia government are now working together on the problem. The government is now requiring logging companies to adopt a better logging method, which is a positive step. However, these measures alone may not be sufficient to ensure a healthy population of the spirit bear in the future. Other steps also need to be taken. While it is important to maintain the spirit bear's habitat, there also needs to be more emphasis on its expansion. The move is justified as it will also create space for other bears that are losing their homes to damp. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four.
That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.